Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Right to Read initiative. My name is Dr. Katherine Garforth from Garforth Education, and in this podcast and webcast, we focus on trying to let individuals understand more about best practices for teaching reading and those early literacy skills. Today, I have Dr. Aaron Schreier joining me from Atlantic Canada, and we're going to be talking about things that she uses in her, oh, what did you call it? Early learning and daycare. Early learning and child care. And child care center uh, and her schools. So thank you so much for joining me again today. If people are wanting to learn more about her journey, you can access one of the previous episodes because you do really have that great journey and it's obvious the passion you have for these young students and little kiddos learning to read and getting that best start in. So today we're focusing on your favorites Mm -hmm. uh, to help do that. So why don't we start off by you giving a little bit of a brief background about yourself and your centers so that um, listeners and viewers can get a bit of a context for where you're coming from. Okay, absolutely. Uh, Thank you. And thanks for having me again. I see I didn't close my door well enough because now my cats are in here. So we'll see. I might have to stand up in a second. Um, So my name is Erin Scryer. I I own and operate early learning centers as well as a private school in um, St. John and Quispamsis, New Brunswick, where I am from. Um, so proud to do that in my community. I do have a doctorate in education where I really focused on studying how the brain learns to read. And so what I really bring to the sector is that piece around um, quality early learning programming and how we can infuse what we know about how the brain learns to read and bring that down to the early years. Because my obsession with the early years really became that we know from an early intervention perspective from just best practice that children's brains are most plastic in those early years. They are ripe for, you know, um, for experiences and for play and they learn so much uh, unintended and intended during that time. And so really, you know, how can we best use the time? I'm really sorry, these two. Don't worry about it. Excuse me. One's going to hide on me now. Yeah, there you go. Okay. My apologies. If it's not children, it's cats. Um, <laughs> I came to my home office so that you wouldn't have to hear, um, you know, children in the background the whole time. Uh, so, yeah, so I um, have been in the field of early learning and child care since 2018. And um, really working with my educators uh, and teams to explain to them how the brain learns to read, and more importantly, how that then translates into our practice in the early years. So in New Brunswick, we're talking about under 12 months, right up until five years of age when children uh, go to kindergarten. In my my case now, with an elementary school as well, I take that right up from K to five. But today we're going to talk about, you know, preschool for us, that is typically four-year-old preschool. I know the models look a little bit different uh, across Canada, uh, but today the specifics I'm talking to would be, you know, kind of things that we're doing in our four-year-old preschool rooms. Awesome. That's so exciting. I, I love to hear it. And I, you know, having a daughter that just turned five, I'm very much aware of the learning that's happening at these uh, ages. And it's just fascinating. I love seeing these little brains work. And I'm, I'm sure you have the same passion. Uh, you know, the thing about their brain, you know, it's a sponge, right? And and one of the interesting things about four-year-old, and if we're talking today, I mean, in New Brunswick, it's the last day of public school. Um, and whether it's the last day, you know, at, at your school or not, you know, we're coming to the kind of end of the, end of the school year and, and transition of summer and summer programming. And then, you know, children going to school, new children coming up to preschool. 
And my educators and I were talking about this. This time of year is really interesting for us because it seems to be the time at which for a lot of children, their skills are starting kind of to coalesce and to emerge as more formal skills. Um, whereas in the early years, we often don't see a lot of the fruits of our labor, you know, because children then move on to school. Um, but this time of year with a lot of our preschoolers, and I'll be careful to talk to that, you know, because it, it you know, in September, for instance, our preschoolers, some of them are three. So you're talking about a very different developmental stage and, and abilities at that point. But this is kind of our sweet spot. Some of these skills are starting to emerge. It's really encouraging and motivating for my educators because you're seeing all that work that you may have done since that child was nine months old. All the language, all the print that you were putting in the environment, all the play that you were doing with nursery rhymes and songs. And now you kind of start to see it emerge into these more formal skills that are a bit easier to see sometimes. So it's a really kind of neat time of year. So it's it's a, it's a great time also for me to have this conversation with you. Of course. And, you know, I was just reading the new, um, let me just open it up so I don't get the title of it wrong. Uh, the teaching phonological awareness guide, uh, in 2022 guide for educators by Jane Ashby, Marion McBride, Shira Naftel, Lucy Hart Paulson, David Kapaltrick, and Louisa Cook Modes. And in there, it's highlighting the fo the focus of those early years. So exactly the age range that you're working with oh and God. how some of those higher level phonological or that not higher level, but um, larger portion phonological awareness skills are just starting to solidify around the age of four. So mm -hmm. those things are like being able to count the number of syllables or clap syllables to words and recognizing rhyming and maybe the first sound being the same in some words. And this is really crucial for setting them up for success for reading. Now, what, what do you do with your kids to, to help them get these skills? I mean, really not just those four-year-olds, but from the beginning. Right. And, and well, that's exactly it. Because as we mentioned on Tuesday, it, it really is that language focus, right? So all children coming into early learning centers come naturally to language. We know, you know, literacy is not natural and that's another beast. Um, but language is certainly natural and is something we see in a fairly routine, steady, you know, kind of emergence from young children. So that we say is kind of our bread and butter in the early years. Um, things we, you know, every classroom is read alouds and we train our educators in interactive dialogic read aloud. So asking the, asking lots of questions, having children participate in the reading in many different ways. Um, you can, you know, set up your reading for a certain skill, maybe that you're, you're looking to share with the children. And then, but also just generally having children interact, we've really moved away from it being, I'm reading to you, to we're reading this book together. And again, you can, two-year-olds love that. They love, you know, telling you what the title is and giving you the word. And, you know, because there's a lot of repetitive readings too. We know that we're repeatedly reading a book is actually really valuable to children. And even as a, as a mom, uh, as a parent, it can sometimes be a little bit, oh, we're going to read this one again. Um, there's lots of, you know, benefits to those repeated readings. So repeated readings and interactive dialogic reading, um, as we talked about before, nursery rhymes and songs. I mean, there is copies of nursery rhymes because let's face it, a lot of us don't know the nursery rhymes or we weren't taught the nursery rhymes or we forget. So I at least have the lyrics to every nursery rhyme, you know, going and fables in classrooms set to music, um, or it says, you know, sing to Twinkle Twinkle Little Star for the gals who may not be familiar with the nursery rhymes. Um, so really asking educators to incorporate that, and that's daily, that we want the read alouds, we want the nursery rhymes, we want the songs. A lot of that, Catherine, as you know, is really, you know, kind of priming children's brains and minds to the sound of rhyme, to the cadence of language, to the fact that we can play with language. You know, I mentioned Sherry Fitch, a poet, and poetry is so critical for, you know, opening children's ears and minds to, to the sound of language, but also for being funny and playing with, you know, as you were saying, the birthday song, right? And you set that all to the same and just being silly and funny in that way. Um, as children, again, 
if we think of this time of the school year, I have preschoolers who have turned five, right? They started turning five in January. So they're, they're the oldest children we really get in our setting. Um, but certainly now we're moving up that, if you think about, you know, I, and I show all my educators, they have copies of from most basic to come most complex, the, the skills related to reading. And so phonological awareness and eventually phonemic awareness. But, you know, you we have children now at this point in the year that can isolate that first sound, who can come up with another word that has that sound, who we love doing sound hunts. So it'll be, you know, OK, who can bring me two things that have the sound in them? And they go around the classroom and find things that have those sounds. We start with the first sound because we know that's the most basic and easy for children to hear. But at this time of year, you know, we would just let them go find anything and you may have a child who brings you something with that medial sound or that end sound. So they're starting to, you know, kind of really move along that basic to complex um, continuum, if you will. And so really kind of meeting children where they are. Uh, but yeah, the sound hunts, you know, the read alouds. And then, of course, you know, as and I'm kind of moving into another skill, but, you know, of course, then the mark making in the same way, right? We're introducing mark making with our nine month olds, you know, even just the dexterity of, of you know, chalk and, and acrylic markers and all those things in their hands where, you know, now this time of year, we are, you know, for our four and a half year olds, five year olds, they, they do have those pencils in their hands and, and, you know, they are making letters and words, especially their names at this time of year. But I digress because we were talking about phonological awareness. Um, those are, you know, some of kind of the three key things that we're doing in our classroom. So I guess to say again, you know, the read alouds, the, the nursery rhymes and fables, and um, playing with the sounds, you know, the sounds that you can hear in words. Mm -hmm. Now, if we think of that bell curve uh, when it comes to reading development, you know, you're going to have kids at the lower end and kids at the higher end. So you may even have in some years kids in your class that are reading. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think this is where some of my knowledge around how the brain learns to read and what's next has been really important because yes, we have many children who, you know, we'd like to think it's all, all what we've done with them, but you know, we also know there's that subset who they have had those experiences. They've had those environments at home and school and they're very clever and they're coming to reading very quickly and very easily seemingly. Um, and certainly knowing, you know, kind of what to do next with those children is really critical. Um, I had a parent um, who came to me with a concern that, you know, the child was really beginning to break, you know, crack the code mm -hmm. and, and learn words. His concern was more, you know, I want to make sure that she's not she's not creating bad habits because he was starting to see some guessing, wanting to keep up with her sister, more memorizing. And, you know, and I look at that as an opportunity. If that child is guessing and memorizing very clever, the brain can do that. Well, I can easily teach that child to crack the code if they're able to do those pieces. But I think one of the challenges and, but it's an opportunity in ECE is to have people, you know, kind of that can continue that continuum, right? For those children who are displaying that they are ready and they have these skills. So what's next for them? Um, because of course, as we're learning through this whole science of reading journey and structured literacy, you know, none of us as educators want to do things that will harm children or will impede their learning. So I think, you know, again, and always thinking about all, all, all these pieces in the space, but that would, you know, kind of be a hope for the space for ECE. Um, is certainly, you know, with that greater knowledge, just our ability to take children to where they're ready for, because especially in the early years, you know, the developmental range and abilities among children is so wide um, and that, but we want to be able to capitalize on that. And if a kiddo, like you're saying, is, is reading and we have readers, we have really skilled readers already in, in preschool, which is really exciting, um, but we want to be able to do that for them and, and have educators who have the knowledge to, to take them there. Right. So do you do any phonemic awareness activities at this time of the year with your students? Yes. Yeah, we are doing phonemic awareness activities. Um, we're doing, um, I saw in a classroom just last week, they were um, segmenting the sounds. So the children were finding 
we like to, I mean, this is just my centers, you know, we follow a Reggio Emilia kind of approach to what we do. So, you know, I will often go to um, the Florida Center for Reading Research website. I've shared that with all of my educators for ideas, you know, so the sound hunt, for example, that would be on there. They would give you, you know, all of the sound cards that you could then print and laminate. Our approach is to use authentic materials in the classroom that are meaningful to children. Uh, so it's just a little, you know, preparation in a different way for teachers. But for example, we had a basket of items and the children were, you know, kind of putting them in order of their first sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of the sound hunt. The phonemic awareness, though, that they've even moved to some segmenting is, you know, a picture of a son and saying, s uh, n. And they, they have it and we're layering on um, now at this time of year, now they're layering on their, their letters, which is a little bit of, a, I don't know if it's controversy, but just some discussion in, in how long we stay exclusively with our phonemic awareness. Certainly in my view, if, if children are proficient with that phonemic awareness piece or say the segmenting, then yeah, let's layer on, layer on the letters because we have seen children, um, including my own. So my son is in preschool right now. So it's very personal also. Uh, but you know, that linking the sound to the letter, to the grapheme now is very difficult for him. He can, uh, mm, yeah, you know, he can segment, he can blend, he can tell you the first sound and make up 20 words that start with B in a second. But as mm -hmm. soon as you layer on that letter, it, it gets much more difficult for him. So I, you know, in kind of that conversation that's emerging around when do you layer on the letter? Do you write from the beginning? Well, that's phonics, that's not phonemic awareness. I think what I've even learned from my experience with him is once they have some proficiency there and, and they're able to, to take on some of those tasks, why not introduce the letter? <laughs> because you never know, you know, if that's going to present difficulty. And if it is, then we just need more time to practice that. Well, the important thing to remember is you're still dealing with preschoolers, kids that are four years old, maybe just five. And at this point, yes, it's great if you include the letter for those kids that are ready for it, but the vast majority of them aren't, but you're not doing any harm having that letter there. Right. Right. And that's, you know, and that's what, that's what it's about, right? Like, yeah offering children things, you know, they're, they're essential, they're at what, what do we say? Advantageous to all, essential to some, uh, and harmful to none. So, you know, always watching for that piece too, you know, is there any harm that that has been indicated in this, like you said, in this instance, it, it hasn't. And I think that's why for me, it's not a controversy, it's a discussion and it's a little bit of playing. And I think just knowing the children. And again, if we know, I guess, Catherine, I can't impress upon this uh, enough. If we know what that kind of basic to complex skill development looks like, then we know kind of what are the pieces that we can layer on responsibly. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, again, as, as an operator of early learning centers and of preschool rooms, it's really equipping my educators with that information so they can make those decisions. Now, we don't do anything in isolation. And, and obviously with the literacy piece, that that's me. You know, people know that as soon as they have a question or they're not understanding, you know, we, we kind of brainstorm around that together. Um, but yeah, I mean, they are, they are still very young children and, and is it exciting as it is, that's where we always say these are still really young children and want to be mindful of, you know, cognitive load and developmentally appropriate practice and all those pieces. Yeah. And, and that's, that's crucial. You know, four-year-olds aren't meant to be readers as a general statement. Mm -hmm. Yes. Especially with a language like English. You know, maybe some of the more transparent languages, it might be different, but, you know, the, the complexity of English's orthography makes it very difficult. And there's nothing saying that we're going to stop those that are ready for it to learn how to read at four and five years old, mm -hmm. uh, in the, you know, that end of preschool phase. But there, we're not saying that you need to sit down and make every student in your class learn those letter sound correspondences. Right. Because that is going to do more harm than good. Right. right. 
And I think that's where we go back to often. It's the approach. It's how you do things, you know. So um, in one of my most recent uh, professional learning sessions with my staff, we talked about phonics and talked about focused on because there's a lot of questions because it is, you know, kind of in in the air these days about phonics and a lot of educators or parents as well. So they're seeing certain things coming home. And so we just kind of had a, a session discussing that piece of things. And for me, it was the approach in that a it, it, playful <laughs> play and, and playfulness is a is a guiding value in our curriculum framework. And I and I, it does resonate with me and it's very important in the early years. Um, but secondly, really, the big piece for phonics and I think for early childhood educators where we, you know, the information that was most valuable there was simply that the you know, that you follow kind of a pre-established scope and sequence so that it makes sense to children that this letter makes this sound so that I can blend it with this sound and that makes a word. Um, it's kind of the important understanding that we're looking for children to have, not so much that they know these 44 sounds. Um, and for, again, the children that are ready for it, that was some of those, you know, those educators questions around, well, where do I start? Do I teach them A to Z? Like, you know, because, and it was okay, no. So that's where for me, it was okay. That was a next kind of place with my staff who have had training in early literacy pieces and how we first started to dabble in phonics is just that there is a pre-established scope and sequence and we follow a, a certain one, but I've shared with them that there's different ones out there. It's really just most important that you're following one um, and kind of has been our, our introduction into phonics and, and letter sounds, again, for those kiddos who are, are ready for that piece. Well, and that's that piece of explicit learning in the classroom, mm -hmm. but I think it's really important to highlight the beauty of implicit learning in the classroom, especially at this late age level with students with a variety of skills. Sometimes they'll ask about the letters in their name and what sounds they make. Don't just not do it because it's not following the soap and sequence. Mm -hmm. Use that as a teachable moment and, you know, talk about it. Let them know what they want to know, but don't be so stringent on oh well that's not in the scope and sequence right. you know at, at this stage we have a lot of logographic reading so that's where kids have memorized the shape just like they can tell you oh it says mcdonald's when they see the mcdonald's sign but if you change the letters around right they don't realize it and if they see mcdonald's written not in yellow with a big golden arch on top of it they're not going to recognize it right, right. right. so we want to help them get an understanding of what they're reading well, and I think you're talking about, so how we approach that in my centers is as much as we want a, a language rich environment for children, we also want a print rich environment. So all of, you know, things on our shelves are labeled from, from infancy on, um, you know, there's, if we can get our hands on, um, you know, construction signs around the classroom or we make our own and like you're saying, logos and kind of those pop culture references um, in writing and really starting um, again with like right in our 12 month rooms is and we and that is something we always say preschool begins in infancy. It's, it is an affordable program. So that's why I define that I mostly time with four-year-olds today, but we start that in 12 months because it is, it's just that implicit immersion in an environment where, you know, there is text and there is print and it is, it starts in two-year-olds, you know, they start to understand that, oh, that label is telling her or me what is in, in that, uh, in that bin for example and and we've had children as young as two and you know they they pretend right or they write pictures and they're labeling what's around their classroom what they're really interested in so yes it's a mix of you know in, and I think you know if I think about the balance of explicit to implicit I think you know it is majority implicit it is you know in the preschool years in the early years zero to five you know we're immersing children in those environments and again, and that's, I'm speaking about this time of year, you know, it's kind of February, March, where it starts with some of our kiddos. Again, we have those January babies, they're turning five. And, you know, we kind of have started to change some or shift into some of this more explicit piece. Um, but, you know, for some children that, that continues, you know, they'll participate in that, but it continues to be kind of the implicit um, surrounding. One of the big uh, pieces at my company, 
and I know for many in early learning and childcare, is the environment's the third teacher. And we very much feel that and our environments reflect that. And if I was better with a camera, I would have loved to show you the classrooms, but I thought, oh, I'll just make people sick <laughs> if I try to do that. Um, but, you know, really understanding how that environment can be set up to support children's language and literacy skills, I think is probably a whole other conversation, um, but one that's really important, particular to ECE as well. Of course. Now, if you're watching this as a replay or listening to it as a podcast, you will see links to your website. So I'm assuming that you have some of those environmental pictures on the website that people can access if they're wanting to learn more about it right now. Yes, yes, absolutely. And Facebook, probably the best place for kind of up to date pictures, but there would be um, pictures of kind of empty classrooms on uh, on our website as well. Wonderful. So let's talk about some of those favorite resources you have for this preschool learning phase. I'm, I'm so excited to see these. Well, so, you know, I really, so I showed you this, this clinical, and I know it sounds and it looks thick, but clinical approaches to emergency liter, emergent literacy intervention. I think Catherine, even talking to you Tuesday, reminded me, and I got a couple messages, thank you for people who reached out around you know, kind of thanking me for talking about the emergent literacy phase. You know, I, it's funny how I spent five years in that phase and then kind of, you know, you keep on going in your journey. Um, but understanding that there's emergent literacy skills that are causally related to these early foundational skills um, and what the pieces are. So this is a fabulous resource. I mean, I have, you know, pulled out excerpts of it for my staff kind of in training type things. Um, again, the big piece in there would be around the interactive read alouds. And just again, how you as an educator, as a parent, um, as a grandparent, how you can kind of up the ante on what you're offering in a read aloud to support children's emergent literacy development. Well, and I, I think, also, sorry, sorry go ahead. I think the important thing to highlight there is if we look at the simple view of reading, there are two parts to the ultimate goal of reading comprehension. One is a word identification that right now at this age, that's not really the main focus, but the second part is language comprehension. And that is definitely something that you can do with kids that you're working with, right? So that's where those interactive read alouds become so important. It's just not reading the book word for word and that's it. It's drawing their attention to the ish, different you know, items in the picture or feelings that the people might be having or what else could happen. How would you feel? And teaching those language comprehension and a little bit of critical thinking. Right. And I did bring, because the other day I looked around and I couldn't even find a picture book without going <laughs> to my children's room. Um, but, you know, and then, so it is the language piece. And I think that is kind of the very implicit natural piece of read alouds and then but again in my master's research and through this 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 resource here from Laura Justice was that you can start to pull out some of those emergent literacy skills say like concepts about print right and that just in in terms of you know eventually asking your three-year-olds for example you know where are the letters on this on on the on the cover uh because we have to take ourselves back and remember that you know children are seeing this as all a picture you know they're not necessarily pulling out that this is the m in, in mummy that they you know write as a picture kind of all the time. Um, so what I really liked about this, this resource from Laura Justice and kind of around the dialogic reading was there was the language focus, but the other side, but the emergent literacy side of the simple view in terms of the print concepts, in terms of even alphabet knowledge, right, that you're pulling out some of the letters that they may recognize in their own name. Children, you know, very uh, egotistical, but particularly in, in the egocentric stage in the early years. So, you know, they're going to know that that's a D in daddy and that's an M in mummy, perhaps, um, and kind of going through things that way. So I think what I took from the interactive reading strategies was there's that whole language part and we can up our ante there, but then eventually that we can actually incorporate some of those emergent literacy skills, uh, such as the, you know, you know, kind of print directionality, some of our letters, concepts about print, you know, even can you tell me what the title tells us, you know, oh, it tells us what the story is about concepts about author and illustrator. I mean, we've had some of the best projects in our classrooms when children say, well, that means I can be an author. 
I can be an illustrator and then they make their own books. Um, but they really got that from, you know, that, no, that is what that name means. You know, it's not just, um, we also had a very interesting conversation about uh, publishers and what that was as well. Um, but yeah, so that would be one of my, you know, kind of prime resources. And I think. Can I put you on the spot? Yeah, go ahead. Can you just do two or three pages of what you would be doing as an interactive reader aloud in your classroom? Yeah, let's go. Okay. Oh, here, I picked this book for a reason. Let me find <laughs> the right page. Ah, yes. We see, I used to do this a lot because during COVID I did a little storybook thing. I've done it in a while. The yellows disagreed. No, we're the best because we're the brightest. The blues were too cool to even respond. Look at the looks on their faces. Did you notice that, like, look at these letters. Are they big or are they small? So, oh, we have a big one here because you know what that says? No, you guys know that. And oh, no. Look at the exclamation part. Beside. That tells me that they were really excited and they were really forceful and they wanted me to say, no, we're the best. And so we're, look, that's what he's saying. Somebody's going to ask you, you know, well, why is it like that? Well, this is a speech bubble. He's saying those words. And that's part of, you know, the very earliest, just that print conveys meaning, you know, text has meaning that this is what he is saying, um, you know, and here I would definitely be pulling out some of those big Bs that I can see, depending again on the class you were in front of, like the beauty of read alouds is the scalability too. So like you could have a class of, you know, two, three, fours in front of you. you might have a mixed group of two to fours in front of you, right? So you're going to have some children who can hone in on that B. They actually know the graphene B. They might know the sound. You're going to have others who, you know, well, where do I start reading the words? Do I read the words up here? Do I read the words down here? Those are words down there. Oh, Miss Aaron, those are words. The words are up here, you know, and that can, even my two-year-olds will tell us where to start reading the words. So and, and I hope that's demonstrating for you. It's still very playful and fun, uh, but they're, you know, they're honing in on that. Those are letters up there. And I guess back to that explicit piece, Catherine, and that's what I was noticing in classrooms was we need that to be explicit for a lot of our children. They're not going to naturally come to, you know, the fact that those are our letters up there. We don't necessarily know what's happening in homes. And despite best efforts, it is a busy, busy time. And families, you know, I think at this point in the world, get on a whole other thing are, you know, more stressed than ever. Um, so, you know, what amount of storybook reading is actually happening, you know, and, and is it that, five minutes before bed, which is, is that beautiful time to connect and have that as part of your routine. One thing I used to really talk to a lot of parents about is, but can you find another time? Is there a time when you have more energy, your child has more energy, you can incorporate some of that stuff. Because some of this stuff I'm doing, I'm not doing at, you know, eight o'clock at night when I'm putting my four-year-old to bed, you know, we're really exactly. reading the book and get to sleep. Getting it done, get to sleep. We don't want a conversation. I'm trying to, no. and it's important to mention that you know, that interactive reader aloud doesn't have to happen every single page because a five page book can take you an hour. That's right. Depending That's on right. how you read it. And sometimes right. it is judging on the mood of your students and yes. their energy level. You know what? We're just going to read this book for pleasure. And I'm not going to focus on bringing out too many elements because right. now's not the time. That's right. That's right. And often I just do the title. Like I, I just do the cover. You can get a yeah. lot done with your cover and then read your book or you read your book the whole time. And then you go back and maybe do one or two pages, but really good point. You know, if we're thinking we have probably between five and eight minutes of our youngest children's time, and that's, that's generous. Um, you know, you, you just kind of balance what, what, what you're going to focus on. Of course. Yes. All right. Any other favorites? Um, so I did want to show uh, Reading for Life, Lynn Stone. I love, I have the spelling booked here too, <laughs> but more for our early years. The chapter in here that was really beneficial for my educators, and I've lent this book out and we're buying more, um, is chapter 23 on teaching the alphabet. So um, it's not without, you know, kind of discussion and, and sometimes disagreement on how that should happen. We approach things very kind of naturally. Again, as I'm telling you implicitly, there's, there's 
um, letters and names and sign-in systems that children are signing themselves into their classroom. I mean, literally from 12 months of age. So children are, are kind of growing up in my centers with that environment. But one thing we do find, and, and we've both alluded to today, without explicit instruction, for example, a child's name, it very much becomes a picture to them, you know, and they may know that that's Bo, my daughter's name is Bo, uh, because of what it looks like. But does she actually know B-E-A-U? And again, this is about January of our four-year-old preschool, you know, my, this, I kind of have a set email that I'll push out and say, Let's just check on our preschoolers. Like, do they really know these letters? Because they, they're, you know, they're getting older. And I think, you know, for the majority, they're developmentally ready for some of that. And so, and some of them have it. They've had it the whole time. Um, but so there's a, a chapter in here on teaching the alphabet. And one of the things Lynn goes through is having your children learn the alphabet as a robot. Because the alphabet song too, right? So many children know it as a song. Um, and do they actually know, you know, what those letters are, what they look like, and they play with the sequence of those letters. So she takes you through a, a really great system in there kind of for that check-in. And then certainly if you recognize that, oh, they don't really know the alphabet, they know the alphabet song, um, you know, kind of how you can take children through that in a really fun way, learning the alphabet like a robot. Um, and then, you know, ending with, and my son's class is working on it, ending with doing your alphabet, saying it backwards. Um, so it, uh, that, that's been a fun journey there. And I think, you know, just always pushing ourselves as educators to understand what do our children actually know? What are the pieces that, you know, are kind of either known be by rote because it's a song, uh, or by picture because I've been writing my name Winnie, uh, you know, for three, four, for two years or so at school. And I always write it the same way, or my teacher always writes it the same way. We'll you often play with it. Right. We'll, we'll play with font. I've even noticed children who know their name in a certain font. Um, so just kind of always changing things up a little bit, even in that implicit environment. Um, so that, you know, children kind of bring attention to like, oh, that sign looks different. That A looks different. Why does it look different? Um, but that would be, this is a fabulous resource. I mean, for anyone, I think for my early childhood educators, it's a fabulous resource. It's a uh, easy read. It's practical. So you can apply it like literally lessons in here. We, you know, we adapt them for our own classrooms and our own approaches, but uh, they're, you know, kind of word for word, how you could, how you could do some of that. And that's one of the ones we've done this year, this uh, teaching the alphabet like a robot. And it's been a lot of fun with the kiddos. Yeah, for sure. One thing I do want to mention uh, is that we are specifically speaking about those early childhood years. So those four-year-olds, when we're not doing formal reading instruction, we are not advocating for teachers in kindergarten, grade one or above to focus on making sure their students can say the alphabet backwards. No, there are no, no. more important things to do when you're actually doing formal reading instruction, but That's it's right. great fun as a casual activity, as a fun activity, especially in those preschool years. Right. And even if we think about the fact that, you know, letter naming and letter knowledge hasn't been causally linked to later reading, you know, there is a um, there's a relationship that's been established in the research. We haven't had enough to say that it's causal. So I use the dynamic indicators of basic early learning sk skills, dibbles uh, in all my uh, K up, not in preschool, um, but in kindergarten up. And, you know, that's very explicit there. And I always appreciate that that's repeated every time I repeat that for my parents. It's an indicator. It is an important indicator, but it isn't necessarily or isn't a causal relationship that they have established at this time. So, yes, I mean, even once we get to formal literacy, see, you know, instruction, we certainly aren't spending inordinate amounts of times with kind of our, our letter naming, but certainly is it an indicator? Is it important? I think so. Yes. I think an important thing for us to mention, especially at this age range is reversals because developmentally it is 100% normal for children to write letters backwards. Yes. And there is that 
big misunderstanding that that means they have dyslexia or a specific learning disorder in reading. The important thing to highlight is that our brains are pre-wired to recognize faces and objects and places and patterns, not letters. Letters are symbols that are a cipher and orientation matters. So this is something that we have to train the brain specifically for letters and numbers. And in those early years before this has been established, children don't understand why they can draw a circle or a square or a diamond in any location and it still is. But when it comes to doing a letter, it matters. Right. Yeah, no. And we, I mean, we see reversals right up through kindergarten, grade yeah. one, you know, you see children who um, we do note taking, we actually teach children note taking and those skills in their notes may have reversals. Um, and I'm talking, you know, kindergarten, grade one, uh, but when they, you know, take the time for their good copy, they turn that reversal around. Uh, so we see it, we can see it there and they may not turn the reversal around at that point, but certainly yes, in the earlier, I mean, yeah, we see all the time and we laugh, you know, it, it's funny and it, because for our brains, it's really difficult to do, but these young ones, you know, they can write a whole, you know, their whole name or a word that they've wanted to know how to write. We have a lot of children ask us, how do we spell this? And so we sound it and then give them the letters but they're, you know, mirrored, they're reversed. And it's, you know, that that's actually quite a talent sometimes. So no, and I talk to parents about it a lot. It definitely comes up as a concern um, and just kind of assure parents that, as you've said, you know, we, your child is in the throes of their brain being wired for this. And this is very ambiguous, you know, kind of characters that that they're learning and that the, the brain is not pre-wired for those you know so for some children that's going to take more practice more repetition um but yeah reversals I mean certainly one of the things Catherine and I'm, I'm moving out of EC so I'll just say it quickly yeah. is um Fine. cursive yeah so we have adoptive cursive writing as one of those pieces especially for our students who do have dyslexia in formal you know schooling as we're moving up through the ages there and finding that cursive writing and there's some research to support you know its adoption for you know kind of supporting those children but again these would be you know children who've had much many more years of experience and engagement with with uh letters that are continuing those reversals definitely so do you have any other favorites that you think we can squeeze in? I don't, I think, um, I mean, I brought one other, one other book really in, you know, knowing that parents are really, you know, kind of engaged and looking for direction often at this age as well. Look at me. I'm like, and eh, do I show it or not? But do it this. So teach your child to read in a hundred lessons. I, you know, I appreciate this resource as certainly the best one that's in my current, uh, in my local Indigo, because there's a lot of books there that uh, I would not, I would not recommend in terms of in our space of reading. Um, but I think, you know, when I went through this text with an educator, again, just understanding how these emergent literacy skills shift into the early foundational skills and how that, you know, primes children for reading. This text was very helpful. Would I actually teach a child, you know, particularly in this way? Not, no, but there's some really good things in there. Um, for us, I think, you know, again, it's, it's that application of all this to the classroom. And that is those read alouds, the nursery rhymes, the explicit vocabulary building around, you know, a project of interest that the children are engaged in and really building out those vocabulary and talking about new words and, uh, you know, kind of having a communication journal with home. So parents even know, you know, like you think right now the monarchs are growing. So we're learning chrysalis and monarch. And, you know, those are great words for the children, our four-year-olds, our three-year-olds are engaging in those words. Um, so I, I guess I just want to say like these resources, I guess I kind of went to resources in terms of for our early childhood educators who may be listening or watching, you know, that are going to provide you good information um, about emergent and early literacy skills. But it's then that, you know, that bridge to the application in the classroom of, you know, the language rich, print rich, read alouds, 
vocabulary uh, and all those pieces that we actually do and be with children um, that are most critical. Of course. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Erin. I've really enjoyed our conversation and I can't wait until next Tuesday when we're speaking again and we're looking at the Ontario Human Rights Commission Right to Read Public Inquiry Recommendations. So this report was released at the end of February and it came up with 157 recommendations about best practices for teaching reading. Now you and I are going to speak about how these recommendations can be applied in the early childhood setting because that setting is really laying the foundations and there are recommendations around screening. And you did mention, you know, doing dibbles. And there are screening measures that we can do in those preschool years that are excellent predictors of future success in reading. These are not diagnostic. We are not labeling children with a diagnosis of a specific learning disability or anything like that. We're just highlighting that this child is struggling in these areas. And we want to provide that explicit instruction and that support so that they can catch up to their peers so that when they do begin that formal reading instruction, they have no problem. That's right. They're ready to fly. Exactly. That's what we want. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Catherine.